So, hello everybody. Uh, I'm a PhD student uh, at the University of Reading uh, and this talk will be about uh, my research. And uh, it, the talk will be divided into three parts. The first and the second part will be much longer than the third one. And uh, it's about the methodology that I developed uh, to take uh, pictures of uh, printed marks of type. And then I will show an example of, my, uh, of what you can do with mis this methodology. And it's about uh, Nicholas Jensen and his Roman type. And then finally I will show a, let's say, contemporary application of this, of this method. So I think, uh, I think it's the methodology I've developed, it's interesting because uh, I'm focusing on 50th century, but uh, actually could be used for any time period, for any printed marks of type of any, of any time. So I take two kinds of pictures in my research. The first uh, is done with a scale magnifier and a compact camera that is put uh, on the magnifier and both lie on the page of the book. So basically, the lens of the, of the camera is in contact with the lens of the magnifier, and I can get, I can achieve pictures like this. As you can see, there is a scale, a scale in millimeters, in millimeters and tenths of millimeters. And the scale is on the bottom of the, of the lens. The lens has a glass circle on the bottom with a scale on it. So it's important for me because I, can, uh, I always have the scale in the pictures. Even if I take pictures in different places, in different time, I always have a scale and I always know the size of things. So pictures like this, like this, they are completely different printers, always Venice, always 15th century. People would think that uh, placing uh, one lens on top of the other, two lenses that are not done to work together, could, uh, uh, could get to some strange things, to some, to some optical uh, implication that, uh, don't work with, uh, that work with distortions. But I made many tests. Here you can see a millimeter paper, graph paper, on the bottom uh, of the lens, uh, and basically, if you play with uh, the zoom length, if you play with, uh, with the camera, you can minimize distortion. Here we basically have distortion just on the edges of the, of the, of the image of about 3%. This means that one millimeter at the, at the end, at the edges of the image, is 3% bigger than in the center. So I basically focus on, <coughs> on the center of, of the images and I take uh, letters only from this part. And I can assure that there is no distortion at all. So the procedure, the, 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 the steps that I take are, are the following. First of all, I take underexposed pictures. It's always better to, to take underexposed pictures. So I correct them manually, one by one. Then I tilt them because it's very difficult to make them completely horizontal at this scale. And then I select the letters that I'm interested in, the best letters for each picture. I select them and I collect them in, in a spread like this. So basically you need many pictures between, I usually take between 50 and 70, 80 pictures for book from different pages. Of course, I first I check the book. I check that the, the typeface along the book is always the same, because sometimes there are changes. And then I, I select the best, the sharpest pages, the best pages, usually pages that are light inked, to, to understand better the shape of the letters. Of one premise that, I premise that I didn't say is that if we talk about 15th century, we don't have anything but the books. So we don't have types, we don't have matrices, punches, nothing survived, nothing came down to us. So our research, our, the research on 15th century can be only on books and on printed marks. The problem of this methodology, of this first step, is that uh, we have uh, a very deep insight into the pictures. We can see the details, but we don't have a clue about how the type works in a body of text. So I take a second kind of pictures with a different setup. You always can see a scale on, the, on some corners on top, a scale of the picture. With these pictures, 
I can, I can understand how the type works, how is the spacing, how is the alignment, and so on, you can see. And the setup is, is this. I use a reflex camera, I use a tripod that has a center, center column that can be removed and placed horizontal, so that the camera is face down, the lens is orthogonal to the page of the book. And I use this frame. It's a plastic frame that I did with a 3D printer, a commercial 3D printer, something very simple. But uh, it's important because uh, in my pictures, in this kind of pictures, I use the, the, the inner rectangle of the frame, and it's always framed in the pictures. Why this? Because in this way, I have a measure, I have a measurement. So I always know that the, the, this, this uh, square is 10 centimeter wide. And so I can compare one picture with the others. So with these two kinds of pictures, I usually make this, this specimen, this kind of uh, rough conspectus. On top, there are some information about the book and about the, the type. And then I use one picture of the, of the one that I call paragraph pictures, made with a reflex camera, and then a selection of the pictures done through the magnifier. You can see that there are several letters, several samples for, for each letters, depending on, the, on uh, how frequent they, they appear. This is because, uh, they, because we need several examples of the same letter to, under, to try to understand what was the original shape. You can see here there are different types. And the, the combination of the two pictures give, give a clear idea of how the type was. Of course, I have, uh, I, I, sometimes I focus much deeper on a type, so much deeper on a book, on the type that is inside the book. So basically, I, I make more than one of these of this PDFs because I collect all the letters, several samples for each letter, or I collect more paragraph pictures, more pictures done with a reflex camera. So, so far, so good, but there are some problems. You can see here there are different impressions, different impressions of the same letter taken from different pages of the same book. And you can see that there is a lot of variation in the shape of the letters. We it's very difficult to understand what was the original shape that the punch cutter cut on the punch. And think that this is rattled, error rattled, and it was one of the best printers of the 15th century. So we're not talking about uh, a low quality printing. We are talking about a printing of a printer that knew what he was doing. Because there is a lot of noise. A lot of noise done uh, probably by casting, but we don't know this because nothing survived. Definitely by the paper. But paper in the 15th century was closer to fabric than paper as we know it. To ink, because the ink was ground by hand. This was a very tedious, very difficult, very long process. So often you see, often ink is three-dimensional in, in uh, 15th century books. And, um, and finally, by the paper, the dampness of the paper, and how the, the people who are inking uh, the, the form are, are working, uh, and so on. There are many variables. But the point is that basically, it's the 15th century type are not stable. The outline is not stable. We don't know very well what was the outline, the original outline. It's very difficult, even with high quality things. I made a test, because there are some historians that uh, uh, hypothesized that 15, 15 some 15th century printer cut more than one uh, shape for each letter. Because, according to these historians, uh, the readers of 15th century were used to manuscript, were used to, s to, to the work of scribes. So these printers decided to cut different shape for each letter with subtle differences one from another, just to, just to solve what they call the dead monotony of the page that 15th century reader, according to them, were not used to. There is no evidence of this. We don't have any evidence that readers were actually bored with printing. But any, and I think that this, this theory is not factual. Anyway, I, made it I decided to run a test. 
So I, I took uh, different copies of the same book uh, and I took pictures of the same word in the same page. That means taking pictures of marks of type done with the same, from the same sort of type. I did it on five different books, five different editions, and I'm showing here just one, that is Jensen, because Jensen ha was uh, one, he was able to print with a sharp, one of the sharpest quality that we can find in 50th century. So, let's see what is the outline in Jensen. Outline taken from the same sorts of type. So we are basically not, f not uh, dealing with casting, basically, because we are the same sorts of type. You can see that, uh, just focusing on these two letters, that uh, the outline is, is not stable yet. It's, it's, it's all, uh, it's all you can understand really which, if you focus on details like this, you know? I and if you try to depict the detail and try to understand which is the detail of the, of the, of the hook terminal of A, in this case, you can see that uh, each copy has a different shape. The same thing with the bottom of P. We don't really understand how the punch cutter cut this detail. So the depiction of the details for my analysis, for the analysis of this material, it's, it doesn't work. It's not helping. And what about measurement? What about measuring uh, parts of letter or uh, you know, portions of letter or from one point to the other, or like in this case, uh, stem of A? First of all, it's very difficult to understand where to start and where to stop because the outline is not straight. It's all, uh, it's all a uh, mess. But anyway, you can see here, even if we try to follow the same path from one sample to the other, you can see that the, there is, of course, the difference is subtle, but they are not equal. The, measures, the measurements are not equal. And the same thing if we measure the, the bottom serif of A. So, and think that we are talking about the sharpest imprints we can find in 50th century, basically. So, if the analysis of these printed marks cannot be based on, uh, ca can be based neither on uh, the depiction of details, of type details, nor the measurement of certain parts of letters, how can we analyze this, this material? What what would be the base of the analysis of this material? Let's go back to the, to the example I showed in the beginning, uh, to Rattle. So, we need to, think, to look at this letter and, and ask ourselves, what does not change in these samples? We know what, ch what, what are the changes, but what does not change? The structure, the framework of the letters, the skeleton of the letter never changes, it's always there, okay? And now can I depict uh, the skeleton of the letter in a very simple way in the digital environment, just taking two samples or more samples. In this case, I took the lightest and the boldest and overlay them. So we know that the skeleton is there. The skeleton never changes. The relative position of the elements of a letter within the letter itself never changes. It's always there, so we know that the height of a central bar is more or less always there. The width of a letter is more or less always there. I show an example of what is this analysis is about. So, still talking about Jensen. We have uh, on the left hand side we have a Jensen page, and on the right hand side we have this page taken from uh, an, uh, an anonymous book, an anonym, a book that was not signed. The two types look very similar one to the other. Of course, there are differences in the quality of printing, so in the inking. There are a lot of differences in the spacing, as you can see. But the spacing was done by casting. So, what I'm interested in here is to understand if these two types have some sorts that come from the same punches, or eventually if they come from the same punches. So, they could be cast in matrices, in different sets of matrices, that were struck by the same punches. And I want to understand if the original framework, if the, if the underlying framework is the same. So I take two letter A, two letters A, I select them from the pictures, and then uh, the first one, the one on the left, I, m I merge it with the 
layer of red. I blend it with a layer of red in a screen mode so that the darkest part of the letter, the, 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 the part that are black, it became red, while the rest it stays the same. And I compare, I work with opacity, and then I work with the opacity of the second A, and then I overlie them, and I reach this. So, I can say that despite the differences on the top, despite some differences in the, in the color of the letter, in the bold, in, in, in how the different elements, the different details of the letter are, the skeleton of the two letters match. So the two letters are likely coming from the same punch. This is the kind of output that I, I do in my, in my research, and you'll see later when I'm talking about Jensen. So uh, we have always the first type on the left, the second type on the right, and uh, the overlying. The first type is always the one on red and the second in, on gray. Let's go on with this comparison. So with this Jensen and Presso Marcialis. You see that Presso Marcialis, the quality of printing is very bad. But you still can see that if we, if we overlie the, the instances of the same letters, they match. There are differences, of course, but the width, uh, the height, uh, the position of the, of, the, uh, of the bottom serif are the same. Same thing with B. Capital B is, another, is one of the letters that I use the most because it has, it has a lot of morphologic, it gives a lot of morphological information. And you can see here, there are different in the, in the thickness of the strokes, but the position of the stroke is always there, never changes. And M, M is even a more striking example, because Presso Marcialis M is just is a big mess. There is not a straight line, there is, it's all, all budgy. But if we, if we overlie them, the two letter matches. Same thing for R. R is another, uh, is another example where we can see that there is the same framework. I did this on all the letters, because when you, when you want to compare two types, you need to do this on all the letters. Uh, here, for a matter of, space, or of time, I'm not showing all the letters, but I can say that this Presso Martialis, these people that didn't sign the books, and they were called Presso Martialis by historians centuries later, they were using a type that was cast in matrices that were struck by Jensen on Jensen punches. Even if the look uh, at the page, when we, when we look with an naked eye on the page, they can look very different. Because one of the most important factors about the type is spacing. And, and the difference in spacing between one sample, between Jensen and, and this other sample is quite, is quite a lot. So this, together with the quality of printing, together with other, other uh, um, things that we can't, uh, we can't uh, measure, like casting, like problems in casting, give uh, a different aspect to the same, basically same shape of letters. So, this is my methodology, and uh, in, my w in my research I apply this methodology to several types of 15th century Venice. One of the most important is the, the Roman type of Nicholas, of Nicholas Jensen, and I will try to, to, to explain today why Nicholas Jensen's Roman is important. I need to make a little premise about Venice. Venice was, uh, well, first of all, this, is, this was uh, colored by hand, because this was a black and white picture, of course. It was a woodcut inside uh, the New Man Chronicle depicting Venice. And Venice was, in 15th century, was uh, the biggest port in Europe, probably, before Columbus. Uh, it, it was the biggest trade center. It was even a big manufacturing center. It's, it seems that he had more than 100,000 people, that is more than today. And uh, it was, a, it was a, a place where, uh, where uh, it was a cosmopolitan city. A lot of Germans, a lot of people from other states of Italy were coming to Venice to work because Venice was, was a center of uh, industrial center, a center of consumption, and a very important trade center. And uh, Venice was uh, the, the biggest printing center in the 15th century. In 30 years, they printed about 13% 
of the all the extant books we have of 15th century. So about one every seven books was printed in Venice. Of course, we have the extant books that don't, the extant edition don't correspond to the edition that were really printed, and we don't know how many editions were lost. But anyway, among the editions that we have today, one, ev one every seven was printed in Venice. But if we talk about edition, we can, you know, one edition could be a booklet uh, with 10 pages, and another edition can be a big book in folio with uh, 300 pages. So editions doesn't mean uh, um, amount of work, it doesn't mean uh, type, the amount of type that was used, the amount of paper, ink, and blah, blah, blah. If we, if we just focus on the amount of type, there are not, s uh, how to say, clear results on this, because nobody have ever have ever done, but there are some, some guessing done on, uh, on, uh, on, on data that, that, that are there. We could say that about 25% of the all the type used in 15th century came from Venice, so quite a, a big amount. But Venice was even a, the, it Venice had even the widest and most uh, and most uh, successful uh, um, trade of books. So the distribution of books. Books were often uh, uh, were often packed unbound inside barrels that was put in uh, in uh, ship and they were they were shipped uh, all over Europe along with other goods. So to cut the cost. And uh, it's interesting because uh, we find uh, editions printed in Venice specifically for markets that were far away. There were printers that specialized in printing liturgical books for uh, dioceses in Spain, in England, uh, in Northern Europe. So they were printing uh, some hundreds of copies that were, all of them they were, so they were sent to ship to Northern Europe or to Spain. So Venice became the biggest center of, of production even because of this, because of this, of this distribution and uh, it was Venice was connected uh, since the, the 14th century so 100 years before starting printing uh, it was connected with Bruges with London with with Spain and with uh, with all Europe basically so if just to use a, a nice comparison if Venice was uh, to Europe in printing what uh, Real Madrid is today to Europe in football the biggest player was Nicholas Jensen, the French Nicholas Jensen. He was, we could say, he was the Cristiano Ronaldo of Venetian printing. So he, he printed for 10 years in Venice, and uh, he was, despite just 10 years of activity, he was one of the most productive, one of the most prolific printers in Venice. And uh, he was able to get, uh, to get appointed by the Pope as a Count Palatine, is a, is a very important uh, award, uh, let's say. And how could he, get, how could he do that? <laughs> Paying a bishop, that was the only way to, to get su such, uh, so it was just a, a matter of money. But Jensen was, ve it was a, a very good businessman. Uh, he was able, he was uh, partnered with some German uh, merchants, and uh, his books are found all over the place. And we know that there were, uh, his books were even in Portugal, in Spain, uh, and of course in London and in Northern Europe. And um, he, we don't know much, uh, actually we don't know, we know almost nothing about what he, do, what he did before 1470 when he appeared, when he opened a shop in, in Venice. Uh, so historians think that he was the director of the, of the Mint of Tours, and uh, there is a legend that somebody are proving today, Lotte Ellinger is proving that this, there is some truth behind this legend, but basically the king, the king of France, Charles VII, decided to ask the Jensen to, to, to do a spy work. So he sent it to Mainz to understand in the end of the 50s. The king heard something about this new invention of artificial writing or something like that, and so he asked one of his men, Jensen, the director of, he was, Jensen was already practice with fine metal working, and they send it to Mainz to try to understand what was going on. This invention could be, could be useful, could have been useful for the king. But then the king died, suddenly died, and his, his, his son didn't care at all about this, mission, this Jensen's mission. So basically Jensen 
somehow reached Venice. We don't know actually what he did in the meanwhile because there are almost 10 years of gap. So anyway, he reached Venice and he opened, uh, he opened a shop in 1470 and um, he was he was one of the most praised printer of 15th century. He was uh, because of this of this quality of his quality as a businessman, and because um, he was very good uh, in self promotion. He, is, um, he was asking, uh, you know, important uh, political figures or important uh, um, figures of the cultural world uh, of Venice to uh, to write uh, premises, to write uh, letters for the author, for, for for the readers, so to write. Uh, paratext to his books and these writers were always praising him you know Jensen is the biggest is the, the, the best printer on, the, on earth and blah 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 so posterity basically deci decided that Jensen was uh, his fame was second only to the, the big the great Aldus Manutius Aldus Manutius was you know something like the Maradona of, of printing so nobody could compare with him and um, ah, by the way, the picture of Jensen is something that comes from the 20th century. We don't have a, a clue about what was his face, you know. Uh, while Aldous Manutius is was uh, this was a, 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 nil, a, a portrait that was d was done uh, during his, his life or a few years after he was deaf. So we can we think that it's his face was very similar to what we see in pictures. While Jensen, we don't have a clue. But Jensen is still. Uh, is, is known today, even outside this, the, the historical, let's say, circle, because of his Roman type. Because uh, he cut, in 1470, he cut this type, and um, it's, we need to think that 1470 was very early for a Roman type. This, it, it, was, it, was, um, it was a time when uh, printers or punch cutters were scouting the local scribe market to understand what could be the shape of their letters. There was nothing before that, you know. So just to, 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 to understand, to try to grasp the quality of Jensen, of Jensen Roman, the quality both as a, as a sharpness of the letters, but uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in here is the choice of the models of his letters. Just to, to grasp this quality, in, you can see here compared with the earliest 12 type cut in Venice. So you see that uh, most of them, would, today we would uh, call them archaic. Today it would be very funny to find shapes like this, you know, in, a, in some printing better. We, it's, it's, they are shape, they follow shape that, that disappeared soon after. We need to think that, that, that the the humanistic script from uh, all these printers took, uh, took uh, inspiration from uh, some humanistic and was in development uh, in those years. So it was not like the rotunda, the, the textura type that had been around for centuries. So the, the shapes were codified and so the scribes were teaching exactly you know, what, you could, what you have to write. For a humanistic type, the, 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 the humanistic script, the script was in development right in those years. And there were many, many variations, many different uh, kind of styles, many different, you know, um, shapes for each letter. So we can see here that Jensen chose the letters that became what today is Roman type. If you compare to all the other examples that you see here, well, yeah, Valdalfa and the Spira too could be used today, but all the rest basically is is quite uh, is quite strange. Would, would look quite strange today. Jensen cut the second Roman type in Venice, and uh, the first one was uh, was uh, with the Spira's brothers that you see on top here, and you can see a comparison between uh, the Spira and Jensen, and you can see how mature, how how modern. Jensen looks like. Of course, talking about modern, I, I do this from a designing point of view, but as a historian, uh, this would, would be seen as an anachronist, so it's, I need to be, to, to be very careful in making these kind of judgments in my work as an historian. But as a designer, and I'm here more as a designer than an historian, I can say that, uh, that uh, you know, that Jensen type was mature, was, was much more successful, of course, and uh, 
he achieved the letter shapes that basically were copied by all the punch cutters after him. You know, he kind of found the model of let the models, the right models of letters, and you can see this because in 1996, Robert Slimak cut uh, design uh, the Adobe Jensen for Adobe, and basically he he followed faithfully the shape of Jensen's letter. You can see here. I need to thank uh, Slimbach because he, always, he, he even included the long uh, S, as you see in the first word in Cine. That is the long S. It looks like an F, but it's a long S. Because until the beginning of the 19th century, there were two shapes of S in lowercase. One, that is the one we know today, but was used only at the end of the world, like uh, reduceres, you see that. And another one that was used uh, at in the beginning or in the middle of the world. Probably it was dropped because it was too similar to F, because it didn't make much sense to have two shapes from a same letter and blah, blah, blah. But in 50th century, all the Roman type had, even the rotunda type, all the Gothic types had two shapes of S. Anyway, what I'm interested in here is that Slimbach made very little changes, very small changes, comparing to the original model. So he, if you, and we, we see still around uh, printed matter with, uh, with uh, Adobe Jensen, is very is used very commonly. We always need to think about, we are looking at shapes that were designed five, more than 500 years ago. And designed to be used on, uh, of course, on metal, uh, on a different environment, but first of all, designed without nothing before that. So where did Jensen take his letter? As, as all the printers, he, was, uh, he based his letter from, from, the, from the script, from the hand of, uh, of the scribes of the area where he was active. So Jensen based his, low, his, uh, his type from what is called, uh, what can be called uh, the Paduan style. But it's a, a, you know, the humanistic script that started in the beginning of the 15th century in Florence with Poggio Bracciolini and, 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 uh, and other scribes, uh, evolved uh, through the, the, the decades. Uh, and uh, from the beginning of the 1450s, so about 20 years before printing came to Venice, there is, um, uh, there is a kind of style, a kind of style, but it's, uh, I'm simplifying, of course, because the, real, the thing is much more complicated. But uh, kind of uh, was developed in Padua, in Verona, in the Venetian area. And uh, it was not just developed by scribes, but it was developed, first of all, by painters, Mantegna, for instance. It was developed by illuminators and by other people that had to do with, uh, with uh, script, with letters. And the point here is that um, they, took the, they took the, cap the Roman capitals, the Roman capitals from the, from the um, imperial age, so after the first uh, century, uh, BC, and they took the Roman capital as a prototype, and they developed a lowercase letter that is more uh, squarish, more uh, um, less attached, one letter to the other, than the Florentine models. We, you see here, uh, I show two s samples of Felice Feliciano and samples of, uh, of Bartolomeo San Vito, that was definitely the biggest name in the 15th century at least uh, in late 15th century calligraphy. But we have many, many more samples in, uh, you know, in uh, archives in Padua, Verona, Venice. Many, many more samples of this kind of style of humanistic script, and they, look, they can look very different one fr from one another. And we have many samples of scribes, but we don't have a clue about the names of these people. It was not, easy, not, not common to sign a book. And a lot of research has still to be done on this, on this subject. Anyway, many historians like uh, Martin Lowry, that he wrote uh, amazing uh, pages on Jensen and on Aldous, wrote about uh, the models that Jensen followed. So they tried to find, uh, they tried to find um, the, the right model the scribe followed. And they mentioned some scribes from Venetian area or scribes from other parts of Italy. 
I looked at all this, this, this supposition, and I can say that none of them is really close to what uh, Jensen's letter. And my opinion as a, as, a, as a type designer, of course, is just an opinion. We don't have uh, anything. Well, we don't know much because we don't know nothing about the typographical adaptation of end writing. Nothing was written uh, about what they did. But anyway, my opinion is that Jensen didn't follow faithfully uh, some letters that, were that he found in some manuscript. He decided to accommodate, uh, to, to modify, you know, he, he probably followed one hand or more hands and he decided to accommodate the letters to be cut on punches. So I'm pretty confident that the work of Jensen was most, that the letters of Jensen was his work, was his adaptation of a, a certain humanistic hand for, uh, for type. And um, and you, we can see here again, uh, Jensen, the, the quality of the of this Roman type. So let's let's go closer to the type. Let's let's look at the type. The, um, the type has a very small uh, excite, uh, as most of the type of the of the 15th century. So the the excite is about f is less than 40 percent of the gauge of type, and this is very small compared to what we are used today. One of the changes that Zlimbach did in, uh, in, um, in Adobe Jensen was to, to increase, not much, but to increase a bit the excite. Think of that, that today types are usually around 50% of the gauge of type. And because this makes a type much more bigger, because it's the excite, as many of us know, it's the excite that gives the size of the type, not the rest. So, Making uh, a bigger excite is even an economical uh, process. You can you can use uh, a type that is uh, you can use more lines within the same page. Let's say like that. So this is the character set of Jensen, as you can see here. And when I when in my work I look at I, I try to understand where the the dissemination of Jensen's type. I basically I, I look at books and uh, I focus on a few letters. So I know that there are a few key letters that has a certain shape, and I always go to see, to look at those letters, to see if they are the same of my target, of Jensen in this case. And, um, and then if I find that these letters match, I go to look at all the other letters. So there are always these key letters in all the types that, uh, in all the type that, uh, that I analyze. There are always these key letters that I have to be a few, because, uh, that because for, for a, for a matter of, uh, of, um, of uh, it's more comfortable to have uh, just a few key letters. So the first one is capital M. Capital M in, uh, in Jensen is quite, uh, it's quite peculiar because uh, it has this, uh, this uh, bilateral series on top and that it's something that will disappear after 15th century. And then uh, this is even more peculiar. It has the, the two stems are straight the one on the left and one on the right hand side. They are straight. They are not usually they are slightly oblique, like in Roman inscription. But here in Jensen they are straight. I never seen any Roman uh, imperial uh, sample of an M like this. I think it's it took this sample more from medieval uh, scripts. I actually I saw in uh, Nicolet Gray's book uh, I saw an M exactly like this. It was coming from a manuscript uh, from a Caroline manuscript uh, of the 10th century. So probably Jensen based his, his capital, is definitely his capital M, on manuscripts more than on uh, Roman inscription. Another letter that is uh, e it's easy to spot in other in other books is capital R. Capital R has this peculiar, you know, tail that looks almost like an elephant tusk, more than a, a proper tail uh, of R. And this is another another letter that is very easy to spot. And then there are uh, some letters that look still talking about capitals. Some capitals that look very wide. Today we would say too wide compared to others, you know, like H and N. If we compare H and N with O, we see that they are very wide. And you can spot it on the page. When you see some words of just capitals or some lines of just capitals, you can spot it very easily. So turning to lowercase letters, one of the most uh, important uh, key, key letters is lowercase d, because lowercase d has this, um, this bottom serif that um, exceeds, it goes much deeper than the bowl. 
and we can see on the pages. I hope you can see it from here. So usually the, the bottom serif of D, it's, easy, it's very easy to spot on the printed page because it's always much lower, much, much it, 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 uh, it exceeds on the bottom than, than the ball. Another letter that is quite easy to spot is E, that has this oblique uh, central bar. All the 15th, most of the 15th century uh, type had oblique bar. And, and it has even this, this, the bar slightly exceeds the ball. And this is some legacy from uh, handwriting. Uh, if you see manuscripts, uh, humanistic manuscripts, most of them was making this, this stroke that was going further than the ball. This is a peculiar thing that uh, not always, you, you, you don't find it uh, all the time uh, because it was probably a very thin, a very fragile uh, stroke that was broken in many type, in many sorts of type. You can see here on the third example that this, this little stroke is almost, is, is almost gone. And finally, letter age is today, we would say that letter H, Jensen H is, is nothing spe special, but actually is his biggest innovation. Because um, in 15th century, uh, letter H has the shape that you see on the right. So it was uh, a round H. It had, uh, it's probably coming from, uh, from the Onchal uh, script. And all the humanist most of the humanistic script has this shape of age. Jensen didn't invent the age that looks like an N with, a, with an ascender, but he basically he copied from some Paduan uh, scribes. I, saw, I found some samples in uh, Bartolomeo Sambito work with this straight uh, shape of age. Jensen, he cut his Roman type in 1470 and he used it uh, very intensively in the first years, in the early years of this, of this business. Then in 1473, there were some problems. You can see that he printed just one edition. I mean, one edition just survived from 1473. But this is not Jensen. This was all the market, all Venetian printer. Basically, 14, uh, 1473, there was an overproduction bubble because uh, you know, we had, uh, in three years, uh, there were uh, several hundreds of editions uh, of mainly classics that were printed, and the market was not able to take. There were not readers enough to take all this huge amount of books. That we need to think that three years before, there were no printing uh, in Northern Italy. So there was a bubble, and uh, most of the printing offices disappeared. And Jensen was able to, to turn to other type of books and to use another style of, uh, of type. So he cut. If you, we don't know if he actually cut his type, we don't have any documents. We suppose that he cut the types, but maybe he used punch cutters, we don't know that. So he ca they cut uh, two sizes of rotunda types, and Jensen started printing uh, basically legal and religious editions. So he sw switched to legal, and, uh, and, and this was a very successful move, because he, he, he kept on being, let's say, successful as in the beginning of his career, just printing other kinds of books. Here we see in blue, there is, it's, it's the edition printed with Roman type, and in gray, the edition printed in rotunda types. At the end, uh, it, they are equal, because they, he printed 45, uh, from what we have, uh, 45 edition in uh, Roman and 45, uh, and 45 in, uh, in uh, rotunda. So, but if, if Jensen stopped uh, using his Roman type, or, or almost stopped, uh, his Roman type is found uh, in many, many printing shops. Now I just show some, some, very, some very brief samples. In Venice and in Northern Italy. And this is something interesting. This was the, the, the uh, Jensen type used in, uh, by, by, Benedic by Benedetto Faeldi, is his name in, uh, in Italian, in Bologna. And have a look of the D, lower case D. Finally, probably, probably lost the matrix of D, of Jensen's D, and so he asked a local punch cutter, this is my supposition, we don't know much about the D, to cut a new, G, a new D that was as close as possible to Jensen's D, but the punch cutter, as you can see, the punch cutter didn't cut 
the lowercase serif as deep as Jensen's. So this is the dissemination of Jensen's type just in, in, the, in the 1470s and 1480s. The, la the latest examples of Jensen type I could find, they are in Mainz at the press of the son of Peter Schaeffer. He used the Jensen's type in the 1520s. Actually, my research focuses on 15th century, so I, I suppose that there are many more samples in Italy and in Europe about Jensen's type. So we can say that Jensen was, was the first one to start a trade of type. Because it w we can't think that uh, this dissemination was, was uh, happened without you know, his choice. He decided to sell metal type and to sell mattresses. We know that he sell mattresses from documents. We know that we know that some of the printers had mattresses because they cast the type more times and so on. So I'll try to be as quick as possible because I'm running out of time. Pa Panfilo Castaldi is a, is a printer, is so sorry, is a Venice Venetian uh, physician that he, was, uh, he opened, he was the baker on one of the first uh, printing shop. And he basically, this is a statue of Panfilo Castaldi in his hometown, and he has this box that apparently is a box of metal type, we don't know much about that. And he, uh, he used this type. You can see on top is Jensen Roman and on bottom is Castaldi. You can see that, can you spot some letters that are different? Can you see some? So, letter G, letter H. Castaldi decided to go back to, to the more common, uh, to the most common shape of age. Letter R is different. S is different. And I think that this is, it was a choice. It was a design choice. It didn't lost the mattresses. So this is the Castaldi. All the other letters, but the one that I showed, are the same. This is an ex a sample of comparison of all the other letters. They, they, they are coming from Jensen's punches. So very fast, because I, I want to finish in, I need to finish in 30 seconds. The, the third part is about uh, the digital, uh, yes, I'm sorry, and I even cut a lot. So. I'm not very good with timing, uh, and yeah, the question about being late, it's, it, was, it was good for me. And, um, and so, basically, with a friend of mine, Michele Patanei, who works in Daltomag, we gave uh, uh, three editions of the same workshop uh, in uh, two Reading students, because I, I'm a PhD student and I have to give some teaching, so I, I give this, this, kind of this workshop that Michele is helping me. So we divided the class into four groups, groups of three people, and uh, we give to each of them an archaic type of among the one that you saw, you know, not Jensen, Jensen would be too easy, and we ask them to analyze the type, uh, to, to try to understand uh, which are the connection between the letters, what was the idea of the punch cutter, and so on. So to make a very deep analysis, and then to start, uh, to start designing it, and to make a, a digital revival of the type. And of course, we, we are going on, I mean, all the time making reviews and uh, discussing with the students uh, about, you know, if you, mm, if you have to change, if it's better to change this or that and so on. And um, it's the point is to make a type as faithful as the original one, but, it's, but that can be used today in uh, publishing, you know. So this, th these are the, the results, some results of the, of the workshop. You know. So, for instance, this is a, a printer called Ambergau. The, the students design, for instance, two, two types, two shapes for E, two shapes for R. The second shape is the original one, but you, you can say that you can't use the second shape of E today. I mean, it would be very, very funny to find it in a book. This is taken from Aldarfer. Another one that I like uh, very much. It's the name of the printer was called Girardengus. And that's it. Thank you very much.